Chicago. And in New York City, black and Latino New Yorkers are dying at twice the rate of their white counterparts. The underlying reasons for these disparities, unequal access to health care, overrepresentation in frontline jobs, the continued effects of housing segregation have existed since long before Donald Trump was sworn in. But his utter lack of preparedness in the face of a growing public health crisis is creating what amounts to a Hurricane Katrina a week. And it's not like he wasn't warned. While the Washington Post counted a full 70 days before Trump took the coronavirus threat seriously, he in fact had several years notice that something like this could happen. There may and likely will come a time in which we have both an airborne disease that is deadly. And in order for us to deal with that effectively, we have to put in place an infrastructure, not just here at home, but globally, that allows us to see it quickly, isolate it quickly, respond to it quickly. Or this warning from a fellow Republican a full 15 years ago. If the virus were to develop the capacity for sustained human to human transmission, it could spread quickly across the globe. And one day many lives could be needlessly lost because we fail to act today. in the middle of this in a day when 800 New Yorkers died in the city where he was born and lived for most of his life, saying his ratings at these news briefings are through the roof, citing a New York Times article that compared his ratings to those of the Bachelor finale. That's what he was tweeting about yesterday. Oh, my God. And by the way, all of these Trump talking heads that are saying we should reopen the economy now, that Fauci, that it's all a hoax, that we need... Hey, Rush Limbaugh... Why don't you go to your local Publix and bag groceries? If you think it's such a great idea. Help out. If you think it's such a great idea to reopen the economy, you can lead by example by going to a grocery store and bagging groceries. You, you can do it today. Sure. You can do it today. And there are other people at other news outlets that say one thing on the air and yet do something completely different off the air regarding the economy, saying, oh, it's a, well, you know what? If you think the economy should, should be opened up, then why don't you go out and, 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 and go out unprotected, without a mask, do whatever you think we should do, and you go out and bag groceries or go out and pump gas? You know, I know and you know you're not going to do that. You're just, you're, you're purposefully trying to amp your ratings by attacking doctors like Dr. Fauci, by attacking science, and you think it will help with your ratings, and you're telling Americans to go out and do things that will kill them, that will kill their loved ones, that will kill senior citizens, and you're doing it for ratings. But you won't do it yourself. So if you're not willing to go out and work in an office with hundreds of people around you, don't tell other people to do that. Because it's just, it's not only hypocrisy, it, it's also deadly advice. And by the way, after all that you have said mm. from the beginning, but like uh, being a booster for the, the president lying about this pandemic, when he said, we only have one person it's from China, nothing to worry about on February 22nd. Uh, when he said, oh, we only have 11 people, soon it'll be down to zero. We only have 15 people, soon it'll be down to zero. It's going to go away magically in, in April. Uh, it, oh, you know, other than that cruise ship, we're doing really great. We only have a few people. I'm not worried at all. After you, you, were, you were going along with the president during that time, giving senior citizens bad advice, giving the children Deadly of senior advice. citizens, bad advice. Giving the grandchildren of senior citizens, bad advice. Giving false security that ended up, yes, we can say this, that ended up killing thousands of people who didn't get the message soon enough. So maybe you should just shut up right now and let the doctors and let the scientists 
and let the medical experts do everything they can do to save the lives of senior citizens. This is, I'm talking about Republican senior citizens. I'm talking about saving the lives of Democratic senior citizens. I'm talking about saving the lives of conservative senior citizens. I'm actually talking about saving the lives of the very people who make up the heart of your audience. You need to shut up and stop talking about rushing straight into the economy because you're going to kill more people. I think we can say that we have to be on that downside of that slope and heading to a very strong direction that uh, this thing is gone. Now, we could do it in phases. We can go to some areas, which you know, some areas are much less affected than others. But it would be nice to uh, be able to open with a big bang and open up our country, or certainly most of our country. And I think we're going to do that soon. You look at what's happening. I would say we're ahead of schedule. Now, you hate to say it too loudly because all of a sudden things don't happen. Uh, but uh, I, I think we will be sooner rather than later. How can the administration discuss the possibility of reopening the country when the administration does not have an adequate nationwide testing system for this virus? Don't you need a nationwide testing no. system for the virus before you reopen? No, the we country? have a great testing system. We have the best, right now, the best testing system in the world. But there are certain People sections, right now, but, there are certain sections in the country that are in phenomenal shape already. Other sections are coming online, other sections are going down. Don't you need that, though, Mr. President, to make sure people are safe going back to work? You don't want to send people back to the workplace. We want to have it, and we're going to see if we have it. Do you need it? No. Is it a nice thing to do? Yes. Uh, we're talking about 325 million people, uh, and that's not going to happen, as you can imagine. And no, it would never happen with anyone else either. Other countries do it, but they do it in a limited form. We'll probably be the leader of the pack. I mean, there, there's so much uh, that, that's just wrong in what the president said. So much lying there. We're not doing better than anybody else. If you so I, I guess at a certain point, it becomes difficult to know what else to say. On the one hand, there are the numbers, which are historically awful. As of this hour, there are more than 493,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases in this country, and more than 18,000 Americans have lost their lives to the virus. And on the other hand, there is the President of the United States, who just one month ago today said Americans should just be calm about the growing pandemic. We're prepared and we're doing a great job with it and it will go away. Just stay calm. It will go away. But everybody has to be vigilant and has to be careful. But be calm. It's really working out and a lot of good things are going to happen. Just stay calm. Fast forward to today. More than three weeks into social distancing to stop the spread. And Trump is now doing this performance where he weighs when to relax those guidelines. Even though his own health experts acknowledge the virus hasn't peaked in many areas. And there's that small matter of the Constitution and a little thing called federalism, which lets state officials make this call. But no, no, no. Trump says it's his decision. Somebody said it's totally up to the president. I saw this morning. It's totally up, and it is. I will say this. Uh, I want to get it open as soon as we can. We have to get our country open, Jeff. Can you say, sir, what metrics you will use to make that decision? Uh, the metrics right here. That's my metrics. That's all I can do. I can listen to 35 people. At the end, I've got to make a decision. Nope. Nope. No, it's not. Federalism. Constitution. Look it up. Yet, according to the Washington Post, behind closed doors, Trump, concerned with the sagging economy, has sought a strategy for resuming business activity by May 1st. Today, when pressed on whether he'd be guided, even if he did have the authority, by his health experts, Trump said he respects Dr. Anthony Fauci so much that Fauci should, get this, run for Congress against New York's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Okay. Luckily, Dr. Fauci had something more substantive to say. But it's important to remember that this is not the time to feel that since we have made such important advance in the sense of success of the mitigation, that we need to be pulling back at all. Meanwhile, 
in New York, which is the epicenter of the coronavirus crisis, at least for now, there was another chilling reminder of the virus toll. This video shows workers digging a trench on New York City's Heart Island to accommodate an increase in burials. Officials say workers are now burying as many as 25 people per day. There are more than 170,000 cases in New York and more than 7,800 deaths. But today, Governor Andrew Cuomo said there are encouraging signs that New York is flattening its curve. Still, Cuomo added that any talk of relaxing restrictions will depend on, say it with me, testing. The key to reopening is going to be testing. Uh, I've said that from day one. It's not going to be a light switch where you flip this economy like you flip a light switch. It's going to be uh, reliant on testing. Uh, testing of antibodies, testing for diagnostic uh, results, and testing on a scale that we have not done before. And according to documents obtained by the New York Times, Donald Trump's own Department of Health and Human Services is warning of a spike in infections if guidelines were lifted after only 30 days. Given it's invisible without widespread testing, how would you know? Well, I think that we're going to have it in retreat with it. Will it be today? No. Tomorrow? No. But it will be at a certain point in the not too distant future. It will be gone. And how do you know about the widespread testing, specifically my question? Oh, well, no, well, no, because people aren't going to go to the hospital. People aren't going to get sick. You're going to know that with that. But we're going to do very substantial testing. We're doing more testing right now than any other country in the world by far. So, Dr. Fair, Donald Trump is saying that he will know that you don't need widespread testing because people aren't going to the hospital and therefore you can let people go back because they're not going to the hospital. Yeah. Again, as somebody who is an expert in this, you dealt with this with the Ebola uh, pandemic. Does that make any sense? No, it's, you know, and again, it's going to come back to testing. Most of these tests, you should be able to do them at your home, I would suspect. Um, the serology or antibody test. This virus after the country. Uh, and now his new thing is to, is to, we're, we're running ads. His, his campaign is a running ad, which we won't show, that shows Joe Biden, the former vice president of the United States, in their mind, in some wrong and nefarious way, engaging Chinese leaders, but they put in an American. They they picture an American, Gary Locke, the former governor of Washington State, in the ad. As as somebody who you know has been an elected official, I have to get your comment on this, Claire. First, well, if, first of all, the ad's insulting because he is actually trying to convince Americans that Joe Biden is somehow on China's side. And by the way, this is coming from a president who took Putin's side against his own intelligence community, who took Kim Jong-un's side against our allies, who has consistently turned to despots and thugs as the ones he wants to buddy up with instead of the leaders of the democracies that are our best friends in the world. So the notion that he's trying to make Americans think that Joe Biden is somehow not on their side and on China's side, but they weren't even sophisticated enough to realize that they were putting in the ad a, a former American governor. It is um, it is incredibly inappropriate, and it is just raw xenophobia. You know, and, and Steve, can you just, I'll give you the last word on this. The idea that Donald Trump called the virus brilliant and called Vladimir Putin, but he won't call or even use the name of the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. He won't call her, but he'll call Russia. It is a strange person that is running the country uh, at the moment in a very odd way. I'll just give you the last word on that. No doubt. And I think it bears mentioning that what we're going to see is stoking of nationalism in this country. We'll see an anti-Chinese campaign and we will see in the 2020 election the Chinese playing the role that Mexicans did in the 2016 election. Geopolitically, at a moment of American weakness, of course, that's dangerous. But I do think it's important to say that two things can be true at the same time. One, the Chinese could have been very late in informing the world about the extent of this, which is true. And two, they could have been profoundly dishonest about their representations around it. While what is also the case is that Donald Trump has been inept, incompetent, and dishonest 
imprecise and unempathetic in his responses. So I think it's very important for Joe Biden, for the Democrats not to fall into this trap and to wind up looking sympathetic in the eyes of American voters towards the Chinese government, who the entire world has legitimate reason to be very angry about for their mishandling of this in the early days. And so when we would look back at history, what we would have seen from Barack Obama back through Harry Truman is an American president calling for an international convention on pandemics about how we bring the world together, how American leadership can drive towards a solution. Instead, we have the American delegation saying no to a communique because they won't use the word Wuhan flu. So it's theater of the absurd that tops off every evening at the six o'clock follies where the American people are lied to nonstop, where he sows confusion, where he sows division, where he attacks the people who need help the most. We've never seen a dereliction of duty. We've never seen a level of unfitness for command. We have never seen a president more visibly failing hour by hour to meet the moment, to meet the test of history that we're seeing with Donald John Trump the 45th president of the United States. And, and I think by the time we get to the end of it, someone who will be universally regarded by historians, along with Buchanan, the 15th president who prefaced the Civil War, is the worst commander in chief in American history. We're the federal government. We're not supposed to stand on street corners doing testing. Frankly, they were, many of the states were totally unprepared for this. So we had to go into the federal stockpile. But we're not an ordering clerk. We have done a hell of a job. The federal government has really stepped up. Well, what I'm asking is what more specifically do you want the governor of Washington? Uh, All I want them to do, very simple. I want them to be appreciative. Cars to receive printed unemployment forms in Hialeah, Florida. That is the stark reality of this pandemic and a recession happening together. And so one can understand under these circumstances the temptation for magical thinking, the temptation to wish it weren't so. But in fact, it was that magical thinking that got us here. When the president wished it all away, when he said it was all under control, the cases were going down, not up, that it was like the flu, that it was all hype, that it was a hoax, that was all magical thinking. And that magical thinking led to the situation we are in now. Burying bodies and mass on Heart Island with millions of people out of work and hungry and desperate. But the magical thinking never stopped. It never quite let reality fully intrude. Just two and a half weeks ago, the president went on Trump TV and said he would love to have the country opened up and just raring to go by Easter this Sunday. He spent weeks pushing a promising but untested malaria drug as a kind of magical cure-all. And you know what? It would be great if that malaria drug could miraculously cure all this. It would be great if we can go back to normal and open the country up and not have the virus ravage our population. I would love to go out to dinner. That would be great. God, I hope that's the case. But hope is not a plan. That's how we ended up here in the first place. So now we have the chorus of magical thinking. All these people that are very influential to a president who is prone to magical thinking, talking about opening the country up before you know it. Trump TV host Laura Ingram has been leading the charge. Here's what she said last night. Unless somehow money really just does grow on trees, we need a reopening soon. A date certain where we can continue protecting the most vulnerable and at the same time reclaim our lives and our God-given freedom. Our God-given freedom. To give you a sense of how another country is handling this freedom, China, a country that probably cares more about their GDP and is willing to sacrifice people to it than just about any nation on Earth. Opening up in China, the virus's first epicenter means four people in a noodle shop of 50. It means everyone in masks, everyone in gloves, constant social distancing, constant testing, temperature checks, contact tracing. That's what normal in China looks like. We cannot go back to normal until we have vaccine. There, there is no business as usual. Things will change. It's not, this is not my opinion. This is what all the experts are saying. Here's Trump's former FDA head, okay? Not some liberal. This is Dr. Scott Gottlieb describing what his vision of a new normal looks like. 
I think things are going to be permanently changed coming out of this until we get to our vaccine and we can fully vanquish this. There are things that are not coming back. People are not going to crowd into conferences. Yeah. They're not going to crowd into arenas. The marginal customer is not going back to movie theaters and cruises and Disneyland. And we need to accept that. Just today, the New York Times reported on new federal projections showing a spike in infections if shelter-in-place orders are lifted too quickly. Those projections were basically leaked to the Times, it appears, from inside the Trump administration. They totally undercut the president's stated wish to open the country quickly. Quote, if the administration lifts the 30-day stay-at-home orders, the death total is estimated to reach 200,000, even if schools remain closed until summer. 25% of the country continues to work from home, and some social distancing continues. We all want out of this. I mean, it's the one unifying thing in a very divided country. God, we all want out of it. But wanting and getting there are two different things. We need a plan of federal action. And that's, again, that's not a controversial thing. Both right-leaning think tanks and left-leaning think tanks have basically reached the same conclusion. There needs to be a intensely coordinated, highly planned, supremely well-executed federal process to get us to the point where we can go about something like normal. Magical thinking will not do that. And here's the thing. Right now, there is no action, none, zero, being taken by the president or this administration or any one of his task force, honestly, none whatsoever, to get us to that point. Uh, yes, I think the uh, Republican nominee is unfit uh, to serve as president. Uh, I said so last week, and uh, he keeps on proving it. The notion that he would attack uh, a Gold Star family that had made such extraordinary sacrifices on behalf of our country. Uh, the fact that he doesn't appear to have basic knowledge around uh, critical issues in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia, um, means that he's woefully unprepared uh, to do this job. And this is not just my opinion. I think what's been interesting is the repeated denunciations of his statements by leading Republicans, including the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader and prominent Republicans like John McCain. And the question I think that they have to ask themselves is, if you are repeatedly having to say in very strong terms that what he has said is unacceptable, why are you still endorsing him? What does this say about your party that this is your standard bearer? This isn't a situation where you have an episodic gaffe. This is daily and weekly where they are distancing themselves from statements he's making. There has to be a point at which you say, this is not somebody I can support for President of the United States. Even if he purports to be a member of my party. And uh, you know, the fact that that has not yet happened makes some of these denunciations ring hollow. I don't doubt their sincerity. I don't doubt that uh, they were outraged about some of the statements that Mr. Trump and his supporters made about the Khan family. But there has to come a point at which you say, somebody who makes those kinds of statements doesn't have the judgment, the temperament, uh, the understanding to occupy the most powerful position in the world. Because a lot of people depend on the White House getting stuff right. 
And this is different than just having policy disagreements. I, I recognize that they all profoundly disagree with myself or Hillary Clinton on tax policy or on you know, certain elements of foreign policy. But you know, there have been Republican presidents with whom I disagreed with, but I didn't have a doubt that they could function as president. I think I was right and, and, and Mitt Romney and John McCain were wrong on certain policy issues, but I never thought that they couldn't do the job. And had they won, I would have been disappointed. But I would have said to all Americans, they are, this is our president, and uh, I know they're going to abide by certain norms and rules and uh, common sense will observe basic decency, will have enough knowledge about economic policy and foreign policy and our constitutional traditions and rule of law that our government will work. And then we'll compete four years from now to try to win an election. But that's not the situation here. And that's not my, just my opinion. That is the opinion of many prominent Republicans. There has to come a point at which you say, enough. And the alternative is that the entire party, the Republican Party, effectively endorses and validates the positions that are being articulated by Mr. Trump. And as I said in my speech last week, I don't think that actually represents the views of a whole lot of Republicans out there. What we saw again today, Joy, is this deadly combination of traits by Trump in the middle of the worst crisis of the 21st century and one of the great crises in the history of the country where the nation has been shuttered. He's incapable of relaying information accurately, number one. He sows confusion. He's been indecisive as a leader. His delays, his incompetence, his ignorance has turned deadly. So there's been a deadly consequence for the fact that Donald Trump is sitting in the Oval Office as the most unprepared president in American history to deal with any type of crisis, let alone a crisis of this magnitude. And so now we watch, I think, yeah. in horror as a country as we see someone who a month ago was saying this will all go away, will disappear, somebody who was telling the American people don't worry about it, somebody who was abetted by his propagandists on Fox News and other places saying this was the flu and the common cold, now we're paying the price for it and the damage that could have been mitigated but wasn't is really incalculable.